Today I'm going to be talking about an approach that my advisor, Margaret Brando, and I are using to better understand and reduce the spread of infectious disease, especially as it relates to the incarceration system and drug abuse. Before getting into that, though, just to orient ourselves, I want to talk about the applications of analytics and health. And there's sort of three main areas. So the first is healthcare operations. And you might be most familiar with this. This might be the scheduling of patients or operating rooms, maybe optimizing facility design or patient flow. Then there's clinical support tools. So this might mean taking a massive data set and mining it to better predict risk or using dynamic programming to determine when to start treatment um, for a patient where the treatment might have some side effects involved. And finally, there's the area of public health. This is the area I work in. A lot of times what we're doing is we're, we're taking fairly amorphous policies. We're looking at very heterogeneous populations, and we're trying to um, standardize our evaluation of these policies uh, so that we can better inform the policy decisions. So a common measure that we will use is cost effectiveness, which is really just trying to get at a sense of um, how much budget investment do we have to make versus how much health benefit do we get from that. To give you an example of some of the areas uh, where my research group has worked, we've looked at bioterrorism and public health preparedness, hepatitis B. Um, a former student of my advisors actually worked on a model looking at the catch-up vaccination for hepatitis B in China. And they found that providing this to children was actually cost saving. And this was really influential in changing the government's policy on that. I work in the area of HIV prevention and treatment. We've done a number of studies. Uh, most recently, we were looking at determining the optimal combination of prevention strategies uh, in an epidemic context where you might have a limited budget. And finally, what I'm going to get into today is um, diversion programs for drug offenders. And this is uh, a new project we're starting. We're really excited about it. And um, I'm excited to share it with you guys today. So uh, first, to give us some context, in 2014, there were 50,000 drug overdose deaths. As perspective, this is one and a half times the number of car crash deaths in the United States that year. So this is a really uh, staggering number. 60% of the overdoses were associated with opioids. Um, and here, we're looking at overdose deaths uh, from heroin, one of the most commonly injected opioids. And you can see that really in the past five years, there's a staggering increase in the number of overdose deaths, not just in what we would traditionally consider a more high-risk male population, but in the female population as well. And so we're really at the, at the level here where we consider this a national epidemic. This is a public health crisis. And people who inject drugs, they are not just at high risk for mortality, they also have high morbidity risks. So bloodborne illnesses like HIV and hepatitis C um, spread very efficiently through, in, through uh, contact with blood, and therefore there's a high prevalence in injecting communities. Also, a lot of high risk behaviors that are associated with injecting um, are commonly correlated with criminal activity. Uh, and so what we can get is that a lot of individuals can become locked into these cycles of incarceration and drug abuse and disease transmission. And there's kind of four driving factors I want to get into. So there's poverty and homelessness, incarceration, high-risk behaviors, both sexual and injection-based risk behaviors, and disease transmission. And what I'd like to convince you of is that this is a really dynamic system, and all of these driving factors are inherently linked and feed into one another. So as I mentioned before, there's really high HIV and especially very high HCV prevalence among people who inject drugs. Uh, moreover, 65% of the incarcerated population in the United States has a substance use disorder. So already, you can start to see this link between disease transmission and incarceration. If for no other reason, then there's a really high overlap in the affected populations. Jail time interrupts uh, drug treatment and treatment for diseases. It interrupts employment. It also increases the risk of um, overdose upon release, because people who have come into the incarceration system with maybe a high tolerance can lose that over the course of their incarceration, and then when they are released, overestimate how much uh, drug their system can handle. So this results in some really substantial health setbacks, personal setbacks, employment setbacks, making it that much more likely that individuals leaving the system will fall into states of poverty and homelessness, which again is going to increase their risk of becoming incarcerated. And finally, um, although these diseases can incubate in the injecting population, it's very easy for them to spread to other marginalized members of society, and then from there to the broader population as a whole. And even within the incarceration system, because you have dense populations, you have very high prevalence, frequent turnover, uh, you can really get increased spread even within the walls of a prison or a jail itself. So here we have this cycle, right? 
And it has profound implications, not just for the individuals involved, but for the public health of our entire country. Now, we can think about ways to try to um, disrupt the system, right? What are interventions we could consider? So we could look at care and housing services, disease treatment. So maybe by virologically suppressing people, they're now less likely to transmit to others. There are behavioral interventions, so condom distribution or needle syringe exchange. Um, and then there's actually looking at incarceration policy itself and trying to change that. Now, um, this last one is a really, it's a hot topic right now because I think, so a lot of cities in the United States, they're starting to look at um, addiction and they're starting to think of it less as a crime that requires punishment and more as a disease that requires treatment. And there's really, I think, a trend going on here that as uh, addiction has moved into this white, the white middle class in America, there's a lot more political will to address the problem that really has haunted our country for decades. So it's not a new problem, but there's interest in new solutions. If you're more interested in this topic, I really encourage you to check out this PBS Frontline special, Chasing Heroin. It's a really compelling and informative documentary about a lot of the issues that we're touching on today. And moreover, it starts looking into policy change and potential solutions. And one of those solutions, uh, which we're gonna get into now, is the LEAD program in Seattle. This is a pilot program uh, where they're taking police officers and training them and giving them the discretion to divert low-level drug offenders into community-based care programs like the LEAD program as opposed to jail. And so by connecting them to the LEAD program, they're more likely to get housing services, uh, disease treatment, drug treatment, and a randomized control trial of this program saw that people who are connected to LEAD were almost 60% less likely to be rearrested following that. And in net, this resulted in $8,000 savings um, because of reduced burden to the criminal justice system in the county. So we're really excited to be partnering with LEAD. We think what they're doing is really innovative in terms of public safety and social justice. But also given the slide that we looked at before where there's this link between disease transmission and incarceration, as uh, d infectious disease modelers, we're really interested in knowing what about looking at this from a public health perspective, right? So what would this policy mean in terms of public health? So some of the questions that we can ask ourselves is, well, how much would we expect HIV and HCV to decrease if we were able to expand uh, the LEAD program to the entire injecting population of Seattle? Or how many overdose deaths might be prevented? Uh, how much cost would be incurred or possibly averted? How many life years could be gained? And then again, bringing this back into the context of policy evaluation, what might the cost effectiveness of a diversion program be? Well, I think we can agree that um, although we might have some intuition about this, a priori it's really hard to give quantitative answers to those questions because this is a really complex system, right? There's the complexity of human behavior um, and choices that are going on. There are very complex disease transmission dynamics. Uh, so what we really need to do to move beyond our intuition uh, is build a model. Um, and that's precisely what we intend to do. So we're going to simulate Seattle's adult population, tracking both our partnerships and arrests over five years, and then measure the costs and health outcomes both with a lead program and in the absence of it. And what we want to do is use the Monte Carlo simulation, which is just really a way to introduce randomness into the model so that we're better reflecting the randomness of human behavior and we run this model many, many times, and then our results are averaged across it to reduce noise. And the model is being programmed in Python, and I wanna now step into that with you um, and talk a little bit about the implementation. So let's say we have a population, we have uh, individuals in our model, and ultimately we're really interested in figuring out what their risk of acquiring HIV and HCV would be. Well, this is fundamentally gonna be, this is gonna be dependent upon their risk behaviors, right? So someone who's centrally located in an injecting network is gonna be a much higher risk of acquiring these diseases. And those risk behaviors are a function of a, a key set of characteristics. So to every individual in the model, we assign them an age, sex, a race, a sexual orientation, and a risk group. So this might be um, a drug, someone who abused drugs or more, moreover injects drugs or doesn't use drugs at all. Um, and we do, we do this assignment such that um, the model population as a whole is reflective of the demographics of Seattle. So let's say now that I have a group of men and a group of women in my model. Um, and there's gonna be two different colors here denoting the different diseases that they might have, HIV or HCV. And there are partnerships that form between people within the model. Um, and given the infected partners, um, 
current state, like the stage of the disease that they might be in, or whether or not they're on treatment, uh, there's some probability that they could transmit to their partner. And so we see in this, in this case, um, let's say in the past month, uh, this male transmitted to his female partner. And then over time, certain relationships dissolve, others might form, new networks form in the model, and again, there's the possibility of disease transmission. So this is the underlying mechanism in the model by which we are keeping track of the dynamics of disease transmission. But what about the structure itself? How do people move through this system? So let's say we start with a high-risk population. Ideally, people are getting into drug treatment. So in drug treatment, they will need to uh, inject less or maybe not at all. And then we would consider them moving into a low-risk population, where now they're much less likely to die from overdose. They're also less likely to transmit or become infected with a disease. So this is kind of the goal. Now, in the model, at any time, people can commit crimes. And again, their propensity to do so will be a function of their individual risk behaviors. If a crime is identified, people can move into drug court or jail. If their sentence length is greater than a year, they can move into prison. And eventually, they will flow out of these places upon release and move back into the injecting population. So we see very little evidence that these societal deterrents are actually interrupting patterns of risk behavior. So it's very likely that people will continue to inject. It's very likely that they will continue to be incarcerated. And so this is an abstraction of that cycle we were talking about before, um, this incarceration and transmission cycle. But now, let's say we add lead into the model. And so now at the time that a crime is committed, individuals can be moved into this program um, and then diverted into drug treatment. So they're much more likely to get connected to those services. And so we would expect now to have a much greater flow into the low-risk population. So to actually quantify that and figure out what that difference and in uh, the lowest population would be and therefore the difference in disease transmission, we need to instantiate the model. And so we take data from a number of different sources and we put uncertainty distributions on all of our model parameters and we conduct extensive sensitivity analysis. And the reason for this is that um, it's a really core component of all policy evaluation to be able to speak to the robustness of our conclusions. And so just as essential as designing the model and um, implementing it and instantiating it with data uh, is, to is to look at our assumptions and do a thorough analysis so that we can speak to the certainty of our conclusions. So this is all on the quest of ultimately trying to better quantify the health benefits of diversion programs. Um, and we're really excited. Uh, we think that, that doing this and uh, looking at it in a model form is a really um, interesting approach not just to public health, but to really start to try to quantify social justice issues um, and, and look at them from a public health perspective. Um, so we hope our findings will be able to continue to uh, national discussions that are really ongoing right now on opioid abuse and incarceration. And I ask if you're interested, please stay tuned because we're just starting up this project. We're really excited about our collaboration with LEAD and uh, we'll have results forthcoming. So thank you guys so much for your time this morning. It's really an honor to speak with all of these very distinguished speakers, um, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. <laughs>